Excellent. Okay, I, let's um, let's get started then. Um, Ed, if you would just advance the slide to our agenda, our agenda here. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Uh, I am Rosa Maurice Clark, Communications and Events Manager here at Crossref, and I'm going to take just a minute to uh, take you through the agenda for today. The times here, um, what we have shown here, uh, would be in Western Indonesian uh, time zone as well as UTC universal coordinated time. So hopefully wherever you are, that's uh, information to get yourself uh, sorted out for where we are on the agenda. Uh, my colleagues will introduce themselves at the start of their sessions and they will be talking about uh, vision and strategy, um, what we've done in our path to POSI, some highlights and what we're planning for next year. And um, then we'll get into the actual annual meeting and the election uh, before we wrap up this year's event. We will have time for questions and answers after the talks um, and before the election. So please add your questions uh, to the Q&A box. And uh, we've allowed about 15 minutes to answer, answer your questions and discuss them. And I should mention, uh, not only should you be able to see the questions, but if anyone has asked something that you're interested in, you can upvote it uh, and comment there. And that will help us to see uh, that more than one question is interested, that more than one person is interested in that question. We will be recording and we will share that file with everyone uh, in a few days time, along with the transcript and the Q&A. And um, that should do it. Okay, let's get started. So Ed, may I pass over to you to kick off with a recap of Crossref's vision and how we're going to make it happen. Thanks very much, Rosa, and welcome everybody. Uh, very, I'm very happy uh, to uh, uh, have you all attending today and, and be able to uh, address you at our uh, second uh, uh, online uh, annual, annual meeting. Uh, but before uh, we get into the vision and strategy, I just wanted to let members know uh, that uh, the voting is open for the Crossref board election until uh, 9.30. Uh, UTC, so just about uh, 20 minutes uh, from now. So most of the members participating in the election will have uh, already uh, voted uh, by, uh, they've provided a proxy and cast their votes in advance. Uh, but if you're the voting member uh, from your organization, you should have received uh, uh, an email at the end of September from eBall at the voting platform. Uh, so you can use that link uh, to vote uh, now for the next 20 minutes. Uh, if you've previously voted but would like to uh, supersede your proxy vote and cast a new vote now, you can uh, email uh, Lucy. Her email is uh, here, uh, and um, uh, you can email her uh, now about that. But uh, there'll be more than from uh, Lucy uh, on governance uh, and uh, and the election in the uh, last uh, last part of our meeting. We've got a great great set of candidates. Uh, up, up for election, so we'll be hearing uh, more about that uh, uh, later on in the meeting. So now uh, on to uh, the vision and strategy for, for Crossref uh, and some updates on how the organization is, is doing. Uh, the last couple of years have been unusual. Uh, the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in early 2020 has changed things and these have been challenging times uh, in many ways, uh, but it's important to remember that scientific and scholarly research have been essential in responding to the pandemic uh, and the whole community has really stepped up. So more research is being done, more and different types of content are being published more quickly than ever before. And it's due to the hard work of everyone involved in the research and scholarly communications uh, ecosystem. Uh, there are definitely problems that need addressing. So research integrity, uh, disinformation, and the difficulty in assessing the trustworthiness of, of content. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion across all aspects of the research and scholarly communications ecosystem uh, need to be in, improved. And on top of this, there's uh, climate change and, and global warming. So uh, from the Crossref perspective, uh, we're thinking about all of these issues and uh, we can't solve them all, but we think we have an important part to play uh, and we need to make some serious efforts and some public commitments uh, in, in these areas. And so uh, we'll be talking about a few of those as we go through uh, the, uh, the, the meeting uh, today. Uh, and I said last year at the annual meeting that um, it isn't a time for business as usual, and it still isn't. So uh, an important thing for me is that what Crossref does is more, more important than ever. And uh, the, the really 
critical point is that open research and open scholarly infrastructure are essential to improving scholarly research and communications and advancing human knowledge um, going, going forward. So with that uh, general introduction, I will move on to um, uh, Crossdress vision. So we've had a mission statement uh, for, for many years, but over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, we've been starting to more clearly articulate our vision of what we're trying to, to achieve going forward. So um, the vision is expressed as a rich and reusable open network of relationships connecting research organizations, people, things, and actions, a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. And so at a high level, this captures what Crossref is about and what, and what we're uh, trying, trying to do. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of detail and a lot of work uh, uh, going on uh, behind the scenes uh, and uh, at Crossref to try to, to make this vision a reality. So um, what Crossref does and, and our conception of ourselves has actually changed a lot over, over the years. We started out with a focus on making bilateral linking arrangements uh, between publishers more efficient, basic journal reference linking uh, with persistent identifiers and metadata, but we're now a much broader enabling infrastructure and we manage more complex relationships between research objects and, and with other types of identifiers. And uh, we've got to establish and maintain trust with funders, research institutions, universities, governments, uh, publishers, uh, societies, uh, researchers as well. Uh, and it's no small task, uh, but, uh, but we've made a lot of good uh, progress this year. And um, in this vision, we talk about the scholarly record and this network of relationships captured in metadata. And we're now referring to this as the, uh, the research nexus. And we've been talking about this for a little while too, but I'm very happy to reveal for the first time uh, publicly our updated representation of the research nexus uh, vision. Uh, credit to uh, Ginny and many others uh, for, for developing this. This is important because it's moving away from this narrow idea of just giving persistent identifiers to, to content. The research objects and entities, uh, there are many, many different types, uh, but what's important, they're still important, but how they relate to each other and the context and how they fit in and relate to other aspects of the whole research ecosystem, the uh, grant, uh, grant funding, publishing communication, post-publication, all these aspects uh, uh, need to be linked uh, together. So we're looking at uh, you know who, who are the funders, what are the grants, who are the grantees, what are the publications, what do they cite, what are they cited by, are there corrections and retractions? Is it being uh, tweeted about? Uh, who are the authors? What institutions are at? There's a whole complex set of relationships here, and this is the research nexus, and um, it's uh, it's uh, it's an ambitious vision, and a lot more needs to happen to achieve it. But I'm really excited by the progress we've made uh, this year and moving forward, uh, and the updates that I'm providing today and and my colleagues will be providing are all really pieces of the puzzle, trying to fit that research nexus together. So we have event data relationships, uh, crowdsourcing corrections, uh, data citations, grant metadata, the credit taxonomy, uh, ROAR IDs for organizations to, to capture affiliation information, ORCID IDs, uh, which have been around for a number of years now, uh, and, 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 a, and a lot more. So really, <clears throat> the metadata and the relationships uh, and the, the metadata that our members register with us uh, is uh, critical to, to everything that we're doing. And the more and better metadata that we get, the more value there is in the system uh, for everyone, members, but also the whole uh, scholarly uh, research ecosystem. And so earlier this year, Crossref updated its strategic goals. Uh, you can see more detail on the, the, the website. We have six key areas that we're focusing on and, and helping to organize our work. And we'll be hearing more details also about these aspects from Jeffrey, Ginny, uh, Brian, and Lucy. So uh, we've got a, a great team at Crossref. So bolstering the team is a, is a key strategic uh, goal. And we've been looking at a range of different uh, areas this year, particularly uh, we've been thinking about how we recruit and how we add staff. Uh, we've uh, looked at uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and reviewed and updated our recruitment policies and procedures. Um, <clears throat> staff handbooks, uh, we've taken, uh, we've undertaken additional staff training and we're participating in the Coalition for Diversity and Scholarly Communications uh, uh, Steering uh, Committee. And uh, we're also focusing on 
uh, our distributed first working culture and good working practices and uh, looking at uh, work-life balance with staff and uh, particularly flexible working uh, and time off and making sure everybody takes uh, time off because it's important to, to take time off and, uh, and, uh, and, and recharge uh, outside, of, uh, outside of work. Uh, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure are very important. Um, we want to be publicly accountable to these principles. Uh, Jeffrey's gonna be talking about this in more detail <clears throat> but uh, one point on the principles is that this has been um, a, a progression for, for Crossref. We've been working towards broader community governance in open infrastructure for a number of years. Uh, and here are some smaller steps, you know, really starting in 2017 over the last uh, number of years, where we've uh, rebalanced the board size uh, um, uh, to make sure that there's representation from a range of different uh, organizations. Uh, and we're also looking at other uh, other uh, types of uh, of members. So, in particular, uh, funders. Most recently, with the um, nominating committee this year, uh, making sure there was at least a fund one funder on the uh, board uh, for uh, um, standing for election in the board. Uh, and um, uh, we've really uh, taken this forward, and uh, we updated our bylaws and um, uh, committees and board elections have, have changed to broaden our remit of, over the years. So more about POSI uh, in a little bit. <clears throat> uh, engaging uh, with communities is critically important. We want to scale these up, strengthen our relationships, and uh, and have uh, clear communications uh, that, cr that Crossref uh, provides. And a core part of engaging with our community is, of course, members. And um, we're still seeing uh, uh, strong growth in in membership and just uh, uh, over the last year, we've, we've membership has grown 24% and we have over 15,000 uh, uh, members now. So I think that's a really healthy, healthy sign of the value that uh, we're providing. I've already mentioned metadata, but improved metadata is a key strategic area for us. We want richer, connected, reusable, open metadata and um, uh, being clear about best practices and making it easier for, for members to give us that uh, that high quality metadata. And as I mentioned, um, uh, we've expanded the type of content we collect. Uh, so we have a, a large range of, uh, of content types uh, that we're registering metadata for. Uh, there's some that we're working on where we don't cover everything. And, and of course they're uh, with uh, working with uh, data site and some other uh, registration agencies. Uh, they cover other content types. Uh, and then, but within this, the, uh, the, uh, complexity of the metadata itself has, has grown uh, because there are links and relationships that we want uh, to have established in uh, the metadata and, and extra information that helps fill out the research nexus that I mentioned before. So things like corrections and retractions, uh, licenses, funding information, uh, preprint to version of record, uh, connections, affiliations with RAR IDs, uh, and uh, we're looking at uh, uh, data citation and the uh, Credit taxonomy are, are the next uh, next items coming up. I did want to note that uh, Metadata 2020 uh, has been a project running for a few years, uh, and uh, while it's um, uh, come to completion, uh, there's a lot of really good resources on the website. So we're asking organizations and individuals to, to sign a pledge about uh, promoting the importance of, of good quality metadata and how it can benefit a society as a whole. Uh, there are a lot of good um, use cases there, some follow on working groups uh, uh, that, that, that are there. And so uh, uh, please, please have a look at this. This is uh, something that's uh, a really useful resource uh, going, going forward. This year, uh, and most recently, a, a big change has been in the number of abstracts uh, that Crossref uh, is collecting. Uh, and uh, through the uh, initiative for open abstracts, that's encouraged a lot of, uh, a lot of publishers to start uh, depositing more uh, abstracts. And with all this metadata, not just abstracts, but all the metadata, if you, you can take a look, at, if you're a member, you can take a look at your uh, participation report. Uh, here's the URL for it. Uh, and you can go and see for, 10 key areas uh, of, of metadata, uh, you can uh, see whether you're actually uh, uh, sending that to us and uh, get information about how to provide it and why, why, it's, uh, why it's important. So please check out your uh, participation reports. Uh, and just a few statistics here. Uh, we've got um, uh, growth across the board with many different content types, but just to highlight here that uh, preprints 
have been growing uh, very, very quickly, over 775,000 uh, preprints now. And we also have the preprint to, to article links. Um, that's been growing about the same rate, but I think we have a little bit more work to do to make sure we establish those, those, those connections. That's really valuable. Uh, peer reviews has been growing uh, a lot. And of course, uh, we're very excited that we've just, uh, uh, grants uh, are uh, a new content type and they're now available through, through the REST API, the metadata, and uh, we've got uh, close to 26,000. And uh, so that's grown a lot. It was from a small base, but uh, that's, that's very exciting to see. And uh, I mentioned before about this research nexus and making connections. A really good example of, of, of joined up research infrastructure is uh, ORCID auto update. If uh, publishers uh, members register the ORCID in the metadata they send to Crossref, that automatically gets pushed to the researcher's ORCID record. It saves them a lot of time. Saving researchers time is a good thing. And we've uh, now pushed 7.8 million uh, publications to uh, ORCID records, and that's grown a lot uh, this year. So we're very happy with that. And as I mentioned, uh, abstracts has really grown. So we're getting close to 13 million abstracts uh, in the system. Collaborating uh, and partnering is very important. Uh, we do a lot of it. This is a, a sticker sneeze as Ginny calls it, but these are examples of organizations we work with, really true collaborations. Uh, technical integrations in some cases, we've co-written, co-developed, and we're working together with, with all these organizations. And ROAR is a particularly good example. We're working with Datasite and the California Digital Library and, and many other organizations on uh, uh, making that registry a, a uh, reality. And uh, we want to simplify our services. So we'll be hearing more, a lot, more about our services from uh, Ginny and Brian uh, coming up. And so I just want to end to remind people about our vision statement. So Crossref 2031, hopefully we'll be uh, even farther along and uh, with, with fulfilling this vision and the, a future Crossref executive director can come back in 10 years and uh, report on how we've, uh, how we've uh, fulfilled this vision and probably surpassed it and, and maybe even having a different vision by that point. So thanks very much. And I will hand over to, uh, to Jeffrey Builder. Hello. <clears throat> um, so I'm here to uh, talk to you uh, about uh, about Posy, and uh, the first thing I should probably do is uh, is describe what we mean by Posy. Um, Posy stands for uh, uh, the Principles for Open Scholarly Infrastructure, and uh, Posy came about largely because, uh, and this is another uh, uh, sticker sneeze slide, I'm afraid. But this uh, POSI came about because we do a lot of collaboration with a lot of different organizations. Um, and, 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 and Crossref always faced sort of two recurring problems. Uh, the first was, although we had an informal set of principles by which we operated, um, uh, because they were informal, they were always sort of open to question. Um, and, um, and as we grew, um, these sort of debates about what we were permitted to do and what we weren't permitted to do became a little more um, uh, tedious to have um, uh, because we always came down on the same side. Um, and so it felt like it was time to enshrine these. Uh, the second reason that we, 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 we wanted to adopt some principles was because it made it easier for us to collaborate with other organizations that share these principles. If we could go to an organization and they said, yeah, we sign up to the POSI principles as well, that, that, that just made collaboration with them a lot easier because it told us what was on the table for collaboration and what was off the table for collaboration. So the principles for open scholarly infrastructure or POSI as we, as we call them are really just a set of guidelines of rules and these are rules that, as I said, Crossref generally followed um, for, for, for almost its entire existence, um, but were never formalized. And they're, they're rules designed to make sure that Crossref is publicly accountable, accountable to its members and accountable to the broader community. Um, and so the rules govern all sorts of things, like, for example, making sure that our governance is transparent and equitable and that we represent our constituency adequately. Um, but they also uh, address things that may also undermine uh, infrastructure that we depend on, such as sustainability. 
right? One of the, you know, if we are all subscribing to an infrastructure and using it and depending on it, we want to make sure that it's run, uh, that it's being run for the long term, and that it's not going to run out of funds, or that it's that, that they're being, um, that they're planning ahead for contingencies. Um, and so a lot of the a lot of the principles revolve around sustainability. And then lastly, there are a set of things that uh, that that sort of that we that we um, classify as insurance that ensure that even if governance and sustainability do fail, that there is a way. Uh, if Crossref uh, or one of the organizations that signs up to POSI does for some reason uh, fail or cease to exist, that the community can take that functionality and continue to operate uh, functionality like it if they decide to do that. Um, I'm not going to go into huge detail on POSI. Uh, I encourage you to go to the Principles of Open Scholarly Infrastructure site because not only are the rules summarized there, but there's also a fact that um, that we constantly update to address some questions that people have about POSI and to clarify things uh, that, uh, that that people might ask about POSI. Um, last year, we adopted POSI formally. So a lot of these principles that Crossref has been following were adopted formally, um, and um, and one of the things that we that we we did was a self audit, um, which was to see. Of the things that we espoused in, in, in the principles for open scholarly infrastructure, how many were we uh, how many were we doing well, and how many were we uh, not doing so well? And we published this audit uh, last year, and over the past year, we've been trying to address some of the areas where uh, where we weren't doing so well. So, for example, one of the things that we highlighted back then was being stakeholder governed. And as our stakeholders had broadened from being primarily publishers to also being things like um, uh, preprint archives and funders and, and so on, uh, we needed to uh, broaden our stakeholder governance as well. And that's something that we've been addressing. Uh, we also talked about transparency of operations. Um, and there were some things there that we needed to do as well. And, and, and we'll be talking about, about a little bit about those things there. One thing I wanna emphasize about this self audit is that this is something that we will be doing yearly. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail at the moment. We're gonna be publishing another self audit uh, in probably a few weeks in December uh, to, to update in more detail exactly what we've been doing over the past year and to evaluate ourselves against all of these criteria. But this is one of the fundamental points about POSI is that it's something that we constantly have to live up to and we constantly have to measure ourselves against. Now, I mentioned that POSI uh, is, it was adopted largely to make it easier for us to collaborate with others. And, um, and I'm glad to say that since we signed up for POSI last year, a number of other organizations that, uh, that we do work with closely have also signed up to POSI. And if you go to the POSI website again, and you go to the POSI Posse um, page, you'll see a list of organizations that have publicly done the same thing that Crossref has done, which is a self audit against the POSI principles and, and, and they've committed to, re, to, to doing these self audits and to living up to these principles. And, and we're really hoping to see some other organizations that we work with on, a, on an ongoing basis to sign up for these principles as well. Uh, we know of at least uh, two or three uh, that we're talking to and there may be a very big announcement soon. So I encourage you to all look at the Principles for Open Scholarly Infrastructure page to see who, is, who are the latest signatories to this. Um, over the past year, and again, I'm gonna summarize because we're gonna do in more detail later, uh, over the past year, we've really been focusing on, uh, on, uh, on revising and making our membership fees more equitable, and also on adapting and adopt and, and changing our representation so that it represents the, our stakeholders more, uh, more uniformly. Um, and, um, and so, uh, for example, one of the things that we've really pursued is, is the idea of getting a, a funder on the board. And so the nominating committee um, has, has, has made sure that a funder was in the, in the elections this year, and we'll see how they, how they do. Um, but, um, but this is one thing is to, to sort of broaden representation. Um, and then the other thing that we've been focusing a lot on is transparent operations. And so if you go to our website and you look at the sustainability and financials page, 
you'll see that we're uh, very, very detailed about our operations, about our finances. You can look up 990 forms. You can do everything from this page. And, and we just, we want to do even more of this. We want to make it as easy as possible to see exactly what we're spending money on and what our members are spending, you know, are, are, are doing and how, and for them to be able to see exactly um, what we're spending our money on. So again, I encourage you to go and look at this page as well. Um, and now I will, um, with that, Posey, I encourage you to look out for an update later, but I will now hand off uh, uh, to, uh, to Ginny. Thanks very much, Jeffrey. I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. Hopefully everything looks good. Um, yes, I'm Ginny Hendricks, Director of Member and Community Outreach at Crossref. I'm based in London in the UK. And um, this section uh, today is gonna talk about not just the membership and community uh, highlights that we've seen, but also the product and technology highlights um, and some of the partnerships we've been, we've been forging and, and what they've resulted in. Um, I'm gonna show quite a number of charts. Um, and uh, I think, I think um, hopefully we won't get too uh, blinded by, by data, um, but uh, I'd like to show this one first. This is one we, we obviously um, show every year and you can see uh, there's been no slowdown in new members joining Crossref each year. And it's likely that we will have close to 3000 new members by the end of this year who've just joined in 2021. And um, we don't really seek to proactively grow this number. Um, although we do a lot to remove barriers so that everyone's able to join, we don't do membership recruitment activities. Um, and members need to be the highest legal entity of an organization. Um, and we always try to consolidate members. For example, if we get applicants from two journals uh, or two departments at the same university, um, we always suggest that they that they that they merge together because they can share efficiencies and uh, and pay one membership fee, of course. Um, so there's been no slowdown. I think Ed and Jeffrey have both talked about scale and, and growth, and, and here it is in the numbers. So where are these uh, new members um, coming from? Uh, well, this is our total membership. Um, the different countries in the world. It's 146 countries now that um, have um, some Crossref members. And um, we have more members in Indonesia than anywhere else. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we're holding this meeting in a time convenient for, for, for Indonesia um, and other parts of Asia and Australia, um, because that's where we're seeing lots of growth. Um, so even just a few months ago, Indonesia made up 14% of our membership. It's now already 15% of our membership. Um, and you can see, for example, where that sits with other countries that probably Crossref was traditionally known for. So, for example, the United States is at just 8.8% uh, 8 .8 of our membership, and that's actually on a par with Brazil and Turkey, really. Um, these are the countries that are joining the most. Um, so Indonesia features there again. Um, so the, the, the close to 3000 members that are joining just this year um, or will have by the end of the year. Um, and it's really exciting to see entering the sort of top 20 trending countries, um, parts of the world that maybe uh, couldn't participate a few years ago. Um, this is largely due to our sponsoring organizations in these countries. Um, so I'm really excited to see South America, like Colombia and Peru, entering the top 20 countries and Moldova, Kazakhstan. Um, and for example, 23 new members only from Vietnam just this year. Um, so I think this is a, a, a testament to the, uh, the outreach and support that our sponsors do in local languages around the world. Uh, so for the countries that are joining for the first time, so making up those 146, um, these are the countries where we've have just one member joining um, for the very, very first time. Um, there are 20 countries on this list joining Crossref just in the last year. Um, so I think uh, this is really showing that, um, you know, many parts of the world are finding Crossref and finding it possible uh, to participate. Um, I mentioned the sponsors program. Uh, of course, we have ambassadors. We have um, only a couple of people who kind of help manage these programs. Um, 
at Crossref and you know we rely very heavily on our ambassadors around the world so I just wanted to say a big thanks to them and to the sponsors. One sponsor in particular is the Public Knowledge Project and uh, over the years we've developed that relationship into a really really strong partnership that involves not just membership and outreach and and sort of um, community collaborations, but really technical integrations as well. So their community has been developing plugins over the years, and now we have a, um, quite a formal way, um, although I say formal, it's all very friendly, um, to uh, encourage and support the development of plugins. So this year we've completed um, reference linking and cited by plugins. Um, so that means that uh, users that use the open journal systems, OJS, can register and manage as much metadata as possible with Crossref and they're participating in the in the in the, the global network. Uh, we are looking at a crossmark plugin so that retractions and corrections and updates can also be included from OJS members. Um, and general uh, management of their Crossref accounts, um, and we want to consolidate the plugins. So that's coming up. That's coming up soon. I also want to mention, as we're talking about partnerships, a sort of um, a more recent one, DOAJ. Uh, that's quite a highlight of, of this year. Was the, just starting a partnership with them, and we we uh, we have actually a list of so many projects we want to get working on together. Some uh data analysis about gaps and we're looking at diamond oa journals with them to see uh which ones aren't in crossref but could be um so while we're talking about growth i wanted to mention that of course crossref is only one of many agencies of the doi foundation so actually including two totally outside of the scholarly space the entertainment industry and the construction industry also used uh, digital object identifiers. Um, but Crossref is still the largest, but our share of the, the world's DOIs is actually going down. And that's as the other agencies like DataCite, KISTI, JALC, um, ISTIC, and, and MEDRA, and others, um, their services grow and become more established. So that's a good thing. And we actively support and work closely with them all. We have regular DOI foundation group meetings and we do lots of other things in between technical and, and community collaborations, joint webinars and lots of things like that. Um, so now if we look at the distribution of the resolutions of those identifiers, so broken out by registration agency, it's interesting that Crossref DOIs account for 94% of all DOI resolutions. Um, so this could be age. We've been around a bit longer than the others. Um, so I want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, maybe we'll do a blog post about it at some point. Um, also to note that this is billions, 7.2 billion DOI resolutions so far this year. So even a small percentage is a lot. <laughs> I just wanted to stress that. Um, but mainly the point I want to make is that this suggests to me that it's, it's not just having the DOIs that matter, it's the services offered that actually makes a difference. So such as linking the aforementioned research nexus, the corrections and updates, the, the similarity checks, um, and the many thousands of tools and services that integrate with and use our open APIs. So this is one of the key points I want to make. Um, the message should never be get DOIs because there are loads of DOIs out there. It's clearly the services and the infrastructure around the DOIs that make the difference to them actually getting used. So we'd like to move the community on in its conversation from getting identifiers to actually integrating them and getting them used. So um, hopefully that, that segues nicely into talking a little bit more about the services that, are, that, that Crossref's offering. Um, so the product highlights of 2021. Um, Similarity check, we've made a lot of progress in the last year or so. We um, signed a new definitive agreement with Turnitin, um, that's the organisation that runs the Authenticate tool. So we've contracted with them and Crossref now takes on all of the service um, and support for that service. Um, there's an obligation to have 90% of full text URLs in the metadata for, for journals um, in order to participate. And it's one of the services we offer that is most valued by our members, I would say. Um, and our members, I think they number about 2,000, um, so a good proportion. They, um, they do nearly 10 million checks each year. So the editors from these, from these uh, members 
check um, to see if they can determine originality of papers. Um, so we've uh, we've just introduced version two of the tool um, only for native users, um, and we're working with uh, manuscript tracking systems um, to help them integrate with um, the new refreshed API as well. There's many new features, a new interface. Um, there's a preprint exclusion filter, which, um, of course, there might be lots of text overlap between a preprint and an eventual version of record. So being able to, to um, filter those out um, is important for editors. Um, there's an increased upload capacity. There's hidden character detection. So, so for sort of Greek or Cyrillic characters, and you can make annotations and save and share reports as well. Uh, one other area that was a big a big deal for us this year it's already been mentioned is raw the the um uh research organizations registry so we introduced support for raw identifiers in our input schema a few months ago um raw solves the author affiliation problem and as ed said already it's a collaboration between the california digital library data site and crossref and it's it really is our best example of a truly collaborative initiative. It's it's um, it's lightweight in terms of overhead, but it still takes a lot of discussion and oversight. Um, but luckily, it's an amazing group of people to work with, which is important as well. Uh, next, I want to talk about Orchid, another key partner, um, and probably one of the first things I ever worked on was the Orchid auto update um, announcement uh, five five or six years ago. Um, and recently, we've had some dedicated work from both sides, from the ORCID team and from the Crossref team. We've been making improvements to this. Um, so ORCID updated its own user interface, um, and we made some changes to the emails that we send to uh, authors explaining who we are and, and why they should grant us access um, to update their records. And since then, we've seen a significant increase in the number of authors granting us permission as a result of these. You can see the numbers there in the last quarter, 83%. Um, and previously it was trending around the 50% mark. Uh, we also in the last quarter focused on resolving some bugs. Um, and so some of our members occasionally put the incorrect ORCID ID in their metadata, but we were still pinging the incorrect author to update. So we've now fixed that. Um, and we're also, we've started the work to upgrade to the latest version of the ORCID API. Um, which means we can send more types of records, um, including grants and peer reviews, and we want to send additional metadata when we push uh, to ORCID as well. So that's coming up next. Um, <clears throat> this is just the one slide on all of our infrastructure work, but it's a biggie. Um, reducing technical debt, uh, reducing toil for our staff and our members, and uh, working to stabilise and upgrade our sometimes 20 year old systems. Um, so security has also been a major focus and we have a new authentication system for all of our tools. Um, we're doing a lot more in the open as well. We have a GitLab um, uh, set of repositories where we're tracking bugs and um, uh, showing, showing our work. Um, we're also in the process of moving everything to a cloud-based infrastructure and anyone who's ever done that will know it's no it's not a quick thing or something you do in one go but it is going really well um having an infrastructure services team uh joel and tim has been essential to that um so some services have transitioned and the big one uh coming up will be our whole content system uh, but brian's going to talk about more uh about that in in the 2022 plan i'm going to finish um, my section with um, uh, going from, I guess, at the beginning, talking about geographic trends in, in membership to um, now highlighting a new type of member, research funders. So for the last 18 months, research funders have been joining and registering grant records that includes awards, use of facilities and other support. So this is in order to help make connections between the input and support of research and the output and outcomes of research. It's really important. And I'd like to share how it's been going. Uh, Welcome were first 18 months ago, and they're supported by Europe PMC. And since then, several more funders have joined. Uh, so we have 13 in total that have actually, we have more that have joined, but we have 13 in total that have started the process and actually registered um, some records. So 
huge thanks to Europe PMC. Um, I definitely want to call out Carly at um, uh, OSTI, part of the Department of Energy in the US. Um, and also a big thanks to Jamie and his team at Altum, whose platform Proposal Central represents half of the members on this list. So, um, but the big news actually is, how did I get this list? Where could you find such a list whenever you wanted to? And look, there's a little link at the bottom. Um, could it be an API query? It could, yes, we have an API query to get um, all sorts of metadata about grants and about the funders uh, supporting this in our REST API. It was just announced yesterday and actually it is probably the most exciting highlight of my year, but maybe I need to get out more. Um, but this question, who is, our, who is registering, which funders, is just one of the questions um, described in yesterday's blog. So please, please take a look at that. Come and get your grant metadata. Um, and it will be uh, really exciting to see the possibilities. Now that we have nearly 30,000 funders in the funder registry, um, it's quite exciting as this program starts to grow and really take off. And that is my highlights of the year. I, I think everyone's really interested now to hear from Brian as well to, um, to see where we go next. And, and I'm looking forward to questions later in the Q&A. Thank you. So thanks, uh, Ginny. Um, I can't turn my camera on, Rosa. So if you want to see my lovely face, uh, maybe you can uh, turn it on for me, otherwise I will get uh, started. Um, so yeah, Ginny, Ginny's just kind of covered off a huge amount of work that we've uh, that we've done um, in 2021. I'm actually surprised that we, we got through it, got through so much of it, um, but we've got a lot more to do. Um, so first of all, a reminder that there is a uh, public roadmap at Crossref. We uh, published this um, in uh, there we go. Uh, published this in June. This was our first attempt at a public roadmap. So you can find it at uh, bit.ly slash crossref hyphen roadmap. And that details all the things that we're working on, um, as well as a lot of ideas that we're starting to, to think about. And it changes frequently. Um, please take a look at it and provide your, your feedback. Um, there is a, an icon, you can see it in this left-hand column here called feedback needed. And um, on occasion, we um survey our members in the general community on the things that we're working on so if you see that icon on any of the tickets and feel that you can contribute then please please do so we found it extremely valuable so far this year um i just wanted to highlight uh, we, do, we don't have enough time to go through the <laughs> entire roadmap um but i wanted to highlight a, a couple of the key themes that are going to keep us busy um next year most of them have already been touched on um by by the other speakers uh the first uh, and clearly one of the most important themes is continuing the work around our own infrastructure um, we made great strides this year um, in uh, supporting our new authentication uh, mechanism, as well as uh, migrating our three REST API pools over to the new in infrastructure. Um, we did have a recent outage in our uh, data center, uh, which, which reminds us of the urgency to, to really complete this work. Um, and there are already plans in place to move Crossmark participation reports, metadata search uh, to this cloud infrastructure as soon as possible. Um, we have a fourth um, pool for our API now. It's an internal pool, and that's where we'll be um, hosting a lot of our services like participation of, uh, reports and cross marks so that they don't get impacted by um, external querying traffic on, on, on the REST API. Um, so we'll be moving reference matching, cross mark, and uh, all those kinds of services over um, in Q1 uh, next year. And then, of course, the the big one, the big migration is the is the main content system. Uh, and here we we know we we know that we have massive peaks and troughs throughout the year for things like content registration. Um, and um, we know that January is a particularly uh, busy time with journal transfers. So moving that to the cloud so that we can get the benefits of auto scaling is 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 really important to us. Um, we're also planning for uh, quite a big improvement to the event data infrastructure um, because we've um, in, uh, 
event data has grown and, uh, and matured over the last couple of years. Uh, I'm really pleased that this year we managed to put a lot of effort in to stabilize it. It's had 99.2% uptime, I think, um, which is fantastic compared to where it was um, the year before. But we've really struggled uh, in event data to scale to the volume of the events and to add new sources to it. Um, moving beyond those external events like connecting a DOI to a tweet or to a mention on Wikipedia, um, we've been um, wanting to add um, inter-work events, so all of the relationships that's in the Crossref metadata, this DOI cites this DOI, um, this DOI was funded by this funder, um, to event data as relations, so moving event data from external events to also including in, um, inter-work relationships. Um, the response by our members to the I4OC, um, the Initiative for Open Citations, has been really, really fantastic. Um, and um, given that so many of our uh, citations are now open, openly available, um, but you can't really get that information from our REST API, we've been working to add 1.5 billion citations to, um, to event data. Um, this has meant that Martin, Joe and Panos, the, the people that work primarily on, on, on event data, needed to fundamentally rethink how we store events and the data that supports it. And they've been prototyping a, a, a new database that will store events alongside our, our other metadata. Um, by doing this for event data, we're simplifying everything that we do, harmonizing the architecture of our content system with the REST API and, and with event data. Um, and that's going to um, give us a really fa fantastic foundation to, to update the rest of our services and build new ones off it. Um, it is the heart of this research nexus. Um, so tracking research objects, metadata, and the connections between them. And also the assertion, so who said what, um, what about what, um, there's a kind of, firmly held incorrect belief that all of the metadata is supplied by our members, um, but Crossref builds a lot of connections between works. And you'll see from some of the other slides, we also want to allow the community to make assertions on that on that metadata as well. Um, so this is, this is foundational. Um, I probably sound like I'm an Apple employee saying that this is the most fantastic thing we've ever done, but um, this has been years of thinking, uh, getting us <laughs> getting us to this point where we can have a single research graph to build our other um, uh, other APIs and services off. And it's going to be a big project through next year, but um, we're really excited with um, with what this is going to um, be able to achieve for us and, and, and for the community. It means that we don't have to move data from silo to silo to silo, for example. Um, another key theme, I know Ginny mentioned this, the growth in the membership is phenomenal. Um, uh, supporting that growth is really, really important. So my Crossref, um, I think we announced this last year, um, but it's going to power all of our user facing features administration uh, and allow members, um, their service providers, sponsors, um, and our metadata plus users to self-serve for a lot of the things that they, that, 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 that they need. Um, we're, we've got, two features for Microsref, which are fighting to be the first features that get live in, in, in Microsref. Um, one of them is um, allowing Metadata Plus users to be able to issue their own access keys, their own tokens for accessing the service. We've heard from them that they'd like to have more than one um, token, for example, to access the services. So we're building um, we're building that out right now. Um, it'll also allow an organization to manage its own um, human users within our system for the first time. Um, so that's going to be very exciting. And then once we've done that for Metadata Plus users, we'll start the work to extend that to members, service providers, so that they where they have system to system connections with us, they'll do it through tokens rather than through our uh, usernames and uh, and passwords. Uh, the other thing, which is um, uh, moving along really well is our new content registration UI um, that um, is uh, going to support grants. Um, first of all, we don't have a, a user interface for registering grants at the moment. Um, so we're well on the way to doing that. Um, we expect to have um, something to um, put in front of funders um, very soon, um, certainly by the start of next year. And our, our new approach to user interfaces, it, 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 
is uh, is a significant improvement. It's uh, the new, the way we build those forms is now driven by our schema, which makes it easier for us to um, get the benefits of an updated schema into the content registration um, systems. It makes it easy for the product team to reorder what is on the screen. Um, it also, I think this audience will be keen to hear about this, um, builds in internationalization from, from the start. Uh, so those interfaces will be available in multiple like, languages, including all of the errors and, um, and help information. And it also comes with built-in accessibility standards. Um, We'll also make it possible for, for members or, or service providers to be able to take that code and build their own versions of those forms to fit their, to fit their own needs. Um, we've been working heavily with some open source projects on this, um, and uh, the developers of those libraries have been really receptive to our approach to work together. That significantly accelerated the uh, amount of work that we can we can get done, but it's also significantly improved our own internal knowledge of of how those libraries work. So um, we are very excited about this. Uh, grants will go first, and then we'll move that out to other um, really important content registration um, uh, types in the future, like journals and, and books. Um, Ginny's mentioned the um, sticker sneeze, I guess, or Ed mentioned the sticker sneeze of all of the organizations that we work closely with. Those collaborations are, are extremely important to us. Um, getting grants announced yesterday as available through the REST API um, is, a, is a real milestone for us. We announced earlier in the year um, support for adding raw identifiers in your, um, in your metadata. Um, so that is possible on the content registration side. And we're just finalizing some of the work to make the raw identifiers um, discoverable um, through, through the REST API. So that should be coming this year. Um, and then I guess another addition to the to the schema is the credit taxonomy, um, which we've got planned in. Um, and, I, and I saw that Judith Barnsby from DOAJ is on the call. So uh, yeah, we are very excited to be working with you um, as, as well on, on this. Um, and Ginny also mentioned the upgrades to the ORCID, uh, latest version of the ORCID API, which means that we can send more information and uh, more, uh, more content types. Um, I think this is my last one, um, so that we can get to the annual meeting and the board elections and some of your questions. Um, I think Jeffrey referred to this as well, but open, rich, complete metadata is extremely important and metadata and the completeness of it is a signal of trust. Uh, and this is, we work um, on a lot of things which help to demonstrate this. So the participation reports will show you what um, types of metadata the members are contributing. Crossmark allows you to understand whether or not something has been updated, whether it's been edited or, 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 or retracted. And access to that open metadata and the analysis of it um, can actually be an early signal from the community that something isn't quite right um, with that metadata. Um, we do see some deceptive behavior, um, such as the reports of fake editorial boards, um, mirror journals, um, we see disputes over title ownership and um, handling this can be quite time consuming for us. So um, we, we're reassessing our role um, in this area. So the legitimacy of the of the member or, or, or the content um, and um, we are um, speaking to some consultants and we will have an RFP uh, very soon. Um, this is going to be a significant piece of work through 2022 um, inv involving metadata as a, a, as a trust signal. Fits very much with the research nexus um, idea as well. Um, one of the things which is related to that, heavily related to that, is community sourced um, corrections. Um, we have mem we have um, authors, for example, contacting us and telling us that there's something wrong with the metadata supplied by the by the publisher. Um, we have people contacting us to tell us that a work has been retracted, even though there's no mention of that in the uh, in the metadata supplied by the member. So um, this is very much a labs project and um, being led by Rachel um, at the moment. Um, but finding a good way for Crossref to help members 
improve the quality of their metadata by having these assertions coming in coming in from the community so we have a proposal out for that at the moment um focus very much on trying to detect um uh, flags of retraction uh, on on various websites and uh, we'll have an update on this on the findings of that research um very soon next year uh, finally, um, the um, our similarity check service is uh, is very much there about research integrity. It helps our members to look and check the originality of the content which is being submitted to them. Um, I won't go over the new features which are available in version two, um, but just to say, uh, new native users, that is users who log directly into the website to to use the service, are already being um, put onto this new version. Existing native users have been contacted about transitioning um, to the new version to get access to the, that improved um, service. And we're working with manuscript tracking systems um, so that they can integrate with the new API to provide that service to, to all of our members. Um, I think um, eJournal Press um, has already been certified uh, and is active uh, on, the, on the new version and editorial manager has work underway and we're working with eight or nine other um, MTSs uh, to get them integrated as fast as we possibly can. Um, part of our research this year um, on um, originality uh, of content has highlighted a couple of areas for um, improvement. Um, we've moved beyond copy and, copy and paste um, problems to paraphrasing and AI generated papers. Um, so that's a key focus for us uh, in, in detecting text problems. And uh, we've also um, been looking at the problems around image um, integrity, uh, such as figures, for example, which might have been manipulated. Uh, with our colleagues at Turnitin, um, we've produced a, a roadmap of additional features that are coming um, for, for the new version of Similarity Check. I won't go through all of these um, in detail, but you'll see that Paraphrase Detection Proof of Concept um, is on there under the Similarity Report and, and Score area, um, as well as the ability to search uh, more easily across your own internal repository of content. So that helps if you're um, running a conference, for example, to be able to search across all of those, all those files. Um, my one call for feedback uh, is um, on our um, survey researching the needs around image integrity, image manipulation detection. Um, this is a new area that we're exploring um, at the moment. And uh, so uh, bit.ly slash image hyphen integrity, there is a survey there that um, Fabienne Michaud, the product manager for Similarity Check would uh, value your input on. So if you uh, manage uh, journals or you're an editor of a journal and you have experience of problems around image um, integrity, then please do take uh, that survey for us. Um, that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Rosa so that we can get into the, the um, annual meeting and board business. Great. Thank you very much, Brian. So we're going to take just a moment. Um, that's going to conclude our presentations for today. And we're going to take a moment and just have a look at the Q&A. And Ginny, I think you're going to help me sort through these. And then we will start the annual meeting and board election. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Sure. Um, so I think we've covered quite a lot, um, even though we tried really, really hard to think of highlights as just the really big uh, things. Um, there's a lot in our roadmap, uh, as Brian said, that we haven't got to. So um, I would say ask anything. We do have time. Um, uh, not that I'm, you know, delaying the board election results or anything. <laughs> Um, so we've got one question that we did want to answer uh, live, uh, and that is actually from, a, it doesn't say who it is, but um, uh, if publishers use Ringgold uh, for organization IDs, and I guess the same goes for other proprietary identifiers, how does that link with the, with the RAW registry? Um, obviously, RAW brings all of these identifiers together. Um, but I don't know if, Ed, do you want to say a little bit more about the Ringgold and RAW connection? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so uh, yes, it's possible to uh, map uh, Ringgold IDs to to uh, Roar IDs. Uh, Ringgold has been uh, participating in the Roar community uh, calls. So um, uh, Roar is a is an openly available data set. So so anybody can do the do the mapping against it. And so I think that um, 
uh, for publishers who use Ringgold, then then hopefully Ringgold will incorporate Roar and do that mapping. Uh, Roar itself uh, in the public data set um, also maps to uh, uh, Wikidata IDs and ISNIs. And I know that there's some linking between Ringgold and ISNI. So there, there's the ISNI connection, which can probably help with the matching. Um, and uh, uh, there's some other identifiers in, 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 in Roar. Uh, and then uh, Roar has been uh, developing some documentation. I just put a link in the chat to some of the Roar documentation about mapping other organization ID types. Uh, and we had a webinar. Uh, you can find the recording of that. Uh, we had a, did a webinar for Crossref member publishers uh, uh, about Roar and in, in integrating with Roar. So it's a process of uh, you know work, w working your, with your suppliers and working with Ringgold. And as I said, they uh, Ringgold's been actively involved with the Roar uh, uh, community group. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. Um, and uh, there are some things that we that we had to take out um, as we were trying to sort of fit fit everything in just just a few hours ago. Um, and I wonder if we could say something um, uh, about data citation and our plans for that. That's actually quite quite a key area uh, has been this year and also next year. And event data plays a part. So I don't know if Brian, you, you'd like to say something about our work with Scolix, the working group, and um, plans for data citation support in our schema. I'm throwing I'm throwing you in the deep end there. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, Rachel's also on the call. She could <laughs> she, she could probably uh, she could probably jump in. Um, one of the um, one of the challenges we've had with event data. Um, so it, uh, event data matches the citations between Crossref and Datacite, um, which supports the data citation um, challenge. Um, but in terms of turning that into data for, for Scolix, um, we have to do additional lookups in our data to find the content type. So the Scolix um, data uh, needs more information. Um, and the work that we're doing on the um, on the graph, the research nexus, will make that significantly easier to do. So I'm really pleased that we're we're, we're getting there. Um, there's also work we're doing in the schema to um, allow members to um, add a type to the references that they're putting in uh, their their references list, so they'll be able to say whether or not that is a, a reference to a, to to data as opposed to um, just um, having a standard references there. Um, Rachel, do you want to add anything else? So I think um, I think those are kind of um, the the key things, Brian. As you said, the um, the um, improvements to event data and updates to the schema. And I think the um, I, I think the other element um, that's kind of key is just like collaboration with industry groups that are um, that are trying to adopt and drive the adoption side of things. Um, so STM and their um, research data efforts. Um, we've um, we've run a webinar with OASP and we've got a workshop coming up um, on that. And then obviously collaborations with um, with colleagues at Datacite and the Make Data Count initiative that are looking at data usage metrics. So I, I think you know, as as with all of these things, there are there are technical elements to being able to support this, which as said we're we're working on, coupled with sort of community understanding, adoption, support, and standards, um, which I think should um, should should really help sort of support publishers and and other. Um, other members of the community and their their aims to be able to to support this and and to make those links between articles and data. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, there's um, one of one of the highlights we didn't cover is that we have um, we have sort of reinvigorated our R and D uh, focus, the research and development, or sometimes called Crossref Labs. And Rachel has joined that team and. Um, uh, one of the questions here is about how um, Crossref will be experimenting with, or if we're experimenting with artificial intelligence. Um, I know we have some, we have a machine learning expert on that team. I don't know if uh, Jeffrey or Rachel, you'd like to say something about our thoughts in that area. Uh, yeah, I can um, say a little bit. Um... So uh, there are a few places where we're looking at AI. I think one of them was mentioned a little earlier by uh, Brian, and that is just um, one of the one of the issues that um, that our members are facing with um, with uh, 
with papers is just uh, the use of AI for generating um, uh, for generating uh, uh, text and papers. And so one thing that we're that that we're very concerned with and we're working with ver with our partners on is the ability to detect AI generated text. Um, this is going to be an increasingly uh, problematic area for uh, for our members. Um, and then there are some sort of smaller experiments that we're doing um, uh, with AI. Um, a lot of them having to do with uh, whether how 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 we can better fill out our classification information in our metadata. Um, our classification information for uh, at the moment is sort of at the journal level, and it's incomplete. We only have classification information for uh, a subset of our journals. And we're, we're looking at some experiments to see whether or not we can actually fill out classification information there. Um, and then after that, we're going to uh, look at see if we can actually do that maybe at the, at the DOI level. So there are a few smallish uh, projects that we have in that area. I think uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is um, you know, people who do very large projects with AI can get into trouble uh, pretty quickly. Um, and so we're trying to uh, stay focused on some very small tractable projects there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm glad we have a few, had a few questions. Um, I think now we'll hand over to Lucy uh, and Emily for the uh, formal annual meeting. Thank Great, you. thanks. I will share my screen. And Rosa, if you can let my video share as well, that'd be great. Hi. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lucy Ofeish. I'm the Director of Finance and Operations for Crossref and also the Secretary for the Board. Um, I'm joined by Emily Cook, who is our external counsel um, from Pierce Atwood. Um, and we are going to do some membership business. So we're going to give some overview on some of our governance practices, um, our financials, and uh, share out the results from the election that we closed just about 45 minutes ago. Um, so as a quick overview for folks as to uh, why we do this annual meeting, we are a 501c6 trade association, um, which means we are governed by our members. Um, and so that's what brings us here today. Uh, our board is composed of Crossref member organizations um, and the board seats are held by the organizations. And so as we, uh, as we elect representatives to our board, um, it is the member organization that sits on the board um, and the individual who is named holds the seat. Um, our board members come from our membership organizations, but when they are uh, in their role as Crossref board members, they are serving Crossref's interests. Um, and so that kind of underpins our structure as, as a membership organization. Um, so the role of the board broadly is to provide leadership and oversight of the organization um, at kind of the basic level, they set the strategic direction, um, working with the leadership staff, uh, provide financial oversight, um, and approve policies and services. Uh, so we have some formal membership business today. Um, there will be two calls for votes. Um, and the way we will run those is that we will ask for motions from the membership. Um, if you would like to move, you can raise your Zoom hand. Uh, Rosa will unmute you. You can make the motion. Uh, we will also be asking for a second for each of these motions. Um, so uh, that being said, um, we will launch into kind of the business portion of the meeting. Um, so notice of the meeting was sent to the membership um, on September 29th of 2021 um, to all of the cross members of record as of September 20th, 2021. Um, this year, that was 15,569 members. 
Um, and each of those members was eligible for one vote. Uh, everyone has an equal vote in the election and um, our, every voting contact receives the ballot with credentials to log in for a unique vote from eBallot, a third party uh, ballot platform. Our quorum, which is our minimum number to be here today is 100 members. We had 1,494 members participate via proxy um, by submitting their vote ahead of the meeting. Um, and so together with those of us who are on the Zoom call today, we have our quorum. Um, so I will turn it over to Emily. Thanks, Lucy. Hi, everyone. Uh, Crossref's board is composed of 16 members. Um, and each year, about one third of the board seats are up for election. Uh, this year, as you may know, there were five board seats to be filled. Uh, in accordance with Crossref's bylaws, the board is structured to maintain an approximate balance between member tiers based on the member's revenue size. This year's nominees were chosen by Crossref's nominating committee. Uh, which is a group of representatives, five Crossref members, um, three of whom currently serve on the board and two who don't. And that's traditionally how the nominating committee is comprised. Um, the nominating committee never has anyone on it um, representing the organization that has a candidate on the slate for the year. The purpose of the nominating committee is to review and create the election slate every year. Uh, for nominations to the board. Um, they aim to ensure fair representation across Crossref's membership. This year's committee is up on the screen and we thank each and every one for their service this year. Thanks, Emily. So um, the nomination process, the committee issues a public call for nominations. Um, any Crossref member in good standing can submit their interest uh, in the board. Um, the committee received 60 validated responses. They reviewed every statement um, and over a series of meetings developed the shortlist of final candidates that we put forward um, to the slate. Sitting board members whose terms are up also go through the same process. They submit their, their expression of interest along with folks that are submitting for the first time. Um, and so everyone has a fair shot at a board seat. Um, and the committee uh, did have a remit from the board this past year. I think Ginny mentioned this earlier to focus on recruiting research funders to who are Crossref members to submit their interest to the board. Um, additionally, the committee looks for diversity in experience, geography, any number of uh, perspectives that's going to enhance what is, is going to complement the current perspectives on the board. Um, so we had a great group of applicants. It was really hard getting down to the final list. Um, and we really encourage everyone uh, to consider standing for the board. We do the public call, like I said, um, usually April or May of um, the upcoming year. So stay tuned for that if you're interested in um, joining a really good board. Uh, so let's walk through the slate. Emily's going to take it from here and then we'll share the final results. So this year's recommended slate of eight candidates put forth by the nominating committee for five board seats was the following. Uh, in the smaller organization tier, for three available seats, there were five nominees, California Digital Library, University of California, Lisa Schiff, Center for Open Science, Nikki Pfeiffer, Melanoma Research Alliance, Kristen Muller, Morissier, Sebastian Rose, and NISC, Mike Schramm. In the larger organization tier, for two available seats, AIP, Penelope Lewis, American Psychological Association, or APA, Jasper Simons, and Association for Computing Machinery, or ACM, Scott Delman. Will someone make a motion to formally place these names in nomination? Yeah, hands raised here, just a moment. 
I've got uh, Melissa Harrison. I'll turn on her mic. So moved. Thanks, Melissa. Can we have a second? Okay, just a moment. Here we go. Oops. All right. Hello. Seconded. Right. Evelyn from uh, Saudi Arabia. Yes, I second that motion. Thanks, Evelyn. Great. Thank you. We will now share the results. Uh, as many of you know, the election was held using a third party platform, e ballot. The election closed today at 9 30 UTC, and the results were available in real time. This year's 2021 board election final results in the tier one category, California Digital Library, Lisa Schiff, Center for Open Science, Nikki Pfeiffer, and Melanoma Research Alliance, Kristen Muller. And in the tier two large member tier, AIP, Penelope Lewis, and APA, Jasper Simons. Congratulations and thank you very much to each and every candidate. Thank you. Um, okay, so the new members will take their seats in March of 2022 um, and serve until March of 2025. Um, thanks, everyone. I will now shift over to a quick financial overview, um, and I will keep it short. Um, Okay, so just what you're looking at here on the screen is uh, 10 years of our financial performance, which you might, uh, you've seen the slide probably over the last few years. Um, we are forecasting this year to end with about 10.6 million in revenue and just under 9 million in expenses. Um, the past two years, we have generated kind of a larger than normal surplus um, because we've seen reduced costs in meetings and events, travel, um, office space, and things that were you know, impacted by COVID. Um, but we haven't seen a corresponding reduction in revenue. So that's what's accounting for the um, kind of differential. Uh, later today, the board meets for their uh, November meeting. They're, they'll be taking up a discussion about how best to manage our operating reserves um, in ways that uh, support the mission, support our members. Um, so stay tuned for outcomes from that discussion. Um, we have seen kind of shifts in our revenue uh, and business model over time. One has been as new uh, services come online, we've seen kind of a rebalancing of the revenue sources between annual dues, subscription fees, content registration, and new services like similarity check, document checking. Um, we've also seen shifts in how our revenue uh, is generated from membership tiers. Um, so what you'll see here is in yellow, you see revenue by membership category um, from the largest membership category to the smallest. Yellow is 2011, blue is 2020. Um, so we've seen a real shift in uh, where our revenue comes from across our membership tiers. Um, and this past year at year end, nearly half of our revenue came from the smallest tiers because we've seen, you know, back to what Jeannie was talking about, we've seen so much growth um, in those categories. Um, so like I mentioned later today, the board is convening for their November session. Over the next two days, they will take up a series of discussions. One of them, though, will be the draft 2022 budget. Um, it touches on all the themes that we talked about today um, and kind of shows moderate growth from this past year. Um, we're forecasting a budget of $11.2 million in revenue, $10.6 million in expenses, um, which would give us about a 6% operating margin. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to membership to ask if there is any other business. Um, before we wrap up, members can put forward business uh, during the annual meeting. 
Um, if there is no other business, I will pass it to Ed. So if you do have business for the membership, just raise your Zoom hand. Okay, I think we can pass to Ed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a few quick items. Um, congratulations to the uh, new new board members. Just a quick couple of items to uh, to wrap up here. Uh, we've got. Uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to the Crossref staff, uh, our people uh, who work at Crossref. It's a really fantastic group of people and a, a great team. And I did just want to note that not long after last year's annual meeting, uh, we lost a valued colleague, Kirsty Meddings, and um, so we had a blog tribute to her. Uh, before um, um, uh, at the end of last year, and just really wanted to um, um, celebrate Kirsty. She was a valued uh, uh, colleague, so um, please, um, uh, you know, have 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 a look and uh, uh, remember remember Kirsty. And um, I just like to uh, thank the whole staff. This is this is all all the the, the, the current Crossref staff. So. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, we've had some new people join uh, over the last uh, a year or so. So I just wanted to, to uh, put their pictures up here and uh, say um, uh, welcome uh, to the to, to them all. Uh, we've got from the top left uh, clockwise. If I hopefully get this all right, <laughs> of course I will. But uh, Carlos, um, Evans, Fabienne, uh, Mike, Panos, and uh, and and Patrick. So welcome. To them, to the uh, to the to the Crossref team, uh, and then a plug for Open Publishing Fest, uh, which Crossref is uh, uh, is is supporting November eighth to nineteenth, and you can propose an event uh, at the uh, URL uh, that is listed uh, listed below. And uh, just to highlight uh, our uh, community uh, forum, this is a great way of of keeping keeping in touch. And um, yeah, uh, being able to um, uh, ask questions uh, and answer questions, members can respond to each other, and uh, Crossref staff are there uh, available to uh, to uh, answer answer questions uh, answer questions as as well. And uh, do you want to uh, wrap things up, Rosa? Then uh, on the last slide. Happy to do that. Sure. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So um, other ways to keep in touch. So there's a lot of information on our, on our blog. And we also have a bi-monthly newsletter, which gives a digest of the most significant posts. Uh, we also run events uh, online on a variety of topics, including our services and tools. And you can find recordings of these uh, presentations and previous events uh, on our events page. And last, um, that should about to it. I think I just want to say uh, thank you before we go to everyone who helped gather information uh, that went into the presentations shared today. And of course, thank you to everyone who took time out of their day to join us uh, for our annual meeting and board election. Thank you. We will get the recording and transcripts and the Q&A out within a few days. And um, stay safe, be well. Um, may I ask for a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you. Oops. Yeah, so Elizabeth. moved. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. And a uh, second, please. Thank you, Melissa. Seconded. Uh, thank you very much. That'll do it. That will conclude our meeting. Uh, stay safe. Be well. Um, we'll see you next time. Take care.